greetings. Thanks to everyone for coming out to our group after reading. This reading is brought to you by Strong Women, Strange Worlds, which is a group of authors supporting authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and other underrepresented gender identity authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror through events like our bi-monthly virtual quick read sessions. You can find out more about Strong Women, Strange Worlds in the handout we've provided in the chat, or we will have provided real soon now, and by visiting our website, a link to which will be added to the chat at https strongwomenstrangeworlds.weebly.com. I'd also like to take a moment to thank those who have made a donation in our tip jar. We really appreciate it. I'm your host today, Sarah Smith, and you can find out more about me in the provided handout as well. Please note, by the way, that recording of this session by the audience is not allowed, and recording of electronic communications, including Zoom meetings and webinars, without permission, is illegal. You will get a chance to re-see any of these readings um, because we're going to put it up on our YouTube channel. Today we'll be featuring six authors. Kelly Aiton, D.L. Howard, J.L. George, C.O. Davidson, Luna McNamara, and Jesse Mahalik. Each author will have eight minutes to read. Y'all ready? Here we go. Our first reader is Kelly Aiton. Award-winning author and Michigan native, Kelly Aiton Kylan begin brings happiness, brings heroines to life in a variety of blended LGBTQ fiction genres. She specializes in romantic speculative fiction focusing on extraordinary women who are as flirt as they are compelling. Kelly will publish her 15th novel later this year with Flashpoint Publications. Kelly, take it away. I'm going to read from Chapter 20 of my most recent book, The Last Scion of Ra. This is a superhero romance that takes place in the same universe as my novel Children of the Stars. 18 years after the Chromadec Uprising of 2020, the world is a very different place. Kaylin Ra Evan lands on Earth, a planet where aliens exist and refugees are fast-tracked to citizenship in many countries. Her tale encompasses the age-old notions of loss, love, and found family. Kaylin tries to navigate her new life on Earth as well as a romance with genius CEO Leah Lockheed Duck, all while honoring her family's legacy as the last of her house. She's wary of the Chromadec Office of Restraint and Protection, a U.S. agency tasked with policing people of power regardless of their race or planet of origin. In an attempt to protect the woman she loves, Kaylin becomes a vigilante, Scion. She won't let laws or the corp stop her from doing what's right. This is a lighthearted scene from Chapter 20. Leah has only recently recovered from a paralyzing injury suffered as a child with the help of nanotechnology created in her lab. Kaylin is currently wanted by the corp because of her vigilante activity as Sion. Chapter 20. The savory smell of dinner tantalized Kaylin and her stomach growled. Will there be enough for all three of us? She didn't have to spell it out for Leah. Her main concern was whether there would be enough to satisfy her high calorie dietary need. Actually, can you bring me the container from my laptop case? Kaylin sp sped through the condo to Leah's office. She found the resealable container and returned to the kitchen blowing a few pieces of mail from the counter, which she quickly picked up. She held the container out to Leah. You may want to go normal speed while Anna is here. I'm aware that our friends know you're an alien, and a few probably suspect that you're Cyan, but you should still be careful. Will you tell her about your recovery like you did with the group on Halloween? Well, yeah, I can't keep something like that from her. She's one of my best friends outside you and Maddie. Kaylin smiled, loving how close the two sisters were. If you trust her with your secret, then so can I. Besides, the entire squad already knows that I'm an alien, at, like Einstein and Nala. Technically, Nala was born on Earth. My point is that none of our friends have a problem with it. She held up her hand when Leah's mouth opened. But if you're concerned, 
I won't come right out and admit it to anyone, and I'll watch my power usage while she's here. Leah lowered the flame on the burner and then approached Kaylin, where she leaned against the counter. Darling, you know that your powers don't bother me in the slightest. I only brought it up because I worry about you. Kaylin looked down. Logically, she knew it was necessary to be cautious, but now that she'd been using her powers a lot more, she felt stifled whenever she had to pretend they didn't exist. I know, and I love you for it. Well, you may love me a lot more for this. I know you struggle to eat enough to satisfy your immense nutritional need. How you were surviving on cliff bars alone for all those months is beyond me. Kaylin frowned at the memory. They were quite tasty, but I was hungry a lot, and I cleaned out many grocery stores in the surrounding neighborhood. Well, knowing that you still struggle, and to save on your food budget, I had one of the labs work on this for you. Leah opened the container to reveal dense brick-like bars inside, similar to the ones she'd been living on when she first arrived on Earth. What are those? Super compacted, high-protein, nutritional bars for extreme caloric need. Kaylin was skeptical. How do they taste? Eh. Leah looked down at the container and shook it a bit to rattle the bars inside. Actually, nobody knows because they're so dense. Clearly, the only people who can eat them are ones with incredible strength and digestive capabilities. So only me then. Leah laughed, perhaps. Go ahead, try one. You're my lab rat for this. Given what I know of lab rats, I'm not sure that's an enviable title. Do you at least know the flavor? Kaylin picked one up and Leah wasn't kidding when she said they were highly compacted. She gave it a sniff. Dr. Folkston said they went with chocolate to keep it simple. Kaylin bit down on the bar and chewed it thoroughly. While the texture wasn't as preferable as something softer, her strength meant that it was easy enough to masticate. The flavor began quite subtly, but by the second bite, it hit her in full and she grinned at Leah. This is tasty. How many calories? 3,000. She stopped chewing for a second and looked down at the bar in her hand. It was hard to believe that such a relatively small thing could hold so much. They're good. Thank you. Kaylin finished her bar and dusted her hands. Then she moved closer and gave Leah a hug and a chocolatey kiss. You smell delicious. Now I need to finish the vegetables or dinner won't be ready in time. Kaylin made a face. Or you could skip the vegetables since they are an inferior food with low caloric value. Darling, not all of us have, well, alien metabolism. Regarding that, I have noticed that I'm burning a lot more calories between walking around my apartment and the physical therapy. Though, Leah tapped her bottom lip and Kaylin recognized the twinkle in her eye. It could have something to do with my ravenous girlfriend. Kaylin grinned. I have been known to amaze even Gabe on game nights with the amount of pizza I can eat. I'm not talking about food, love. Oh, Kaylin blinked at her, then Leah's meaning hit. Oh, her grin grew as she moved even closer to Leah. Leah put a hand against her chest. Oh, no, you don't. We have company coming over and I need to finish dinner. Maybe Anna could visit tomorrow. She's already on her way. Kaylin opened her mouth to say something, but heard the telltale sound of the elevator rising. She is literally nearly here. Do you want your chair? Leah sighed. Fine. With a burst of speed, Kaylin fetched the hover chair. Leah got herself situated in the seat seconds before the door was open. Anna stepped through, carrying her purse, another bag, and a bottle of wine. Sorry, I'm a little early, but I brought dessert. Kaylin looked from Anna back to Leah. I changed my mind. She can stay. Leah rolled her eyes. I'm glad your sweet tooth is so accommodating with our friends. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And um, I see your your cool uh, sweatshirt and having a having a sweatshirt that belongs only to you. That's great, and the story <laughs> was great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our second reader, <coughs> excuse me, is D. L. Howard. D. L. Howard is an author who lives to write high fantasy and urban fantasy with a diverse cast of characters. With a deep passion for photography and traveling, she draws inspiration from the two to help inspire her creativity and bring unique and engrossing stories to her readers. DL, over to you. Thank you. I'll be reading um, the beginning of my book that you see right there. Uh, the long night was unusually dark and silent until it wasn't. Even on an evening like it was, there would always be someone scurrying around. Yet the streets were strangely empty. His gaze slowly looked up at the darkened sky and his face twisted into a grimace at what he saw. 
flashes of lightning illuminating the distance, revealing a smattering of dark gray clouds that were drifting across the mo mostly clear sky. The sight of them didn't sit well with him. There was something about it that made him uncomfortable with it all, even if he was protected. Following in his wake, a deep rumbling sound reverberated through the air like a powerful drumbeat. It was reminiscent of the heart pounding cadence one heard during their sacred rituals. The volatile mix was nature's way of brewing a dangerous storm. It threatened the peace throughout the land that was accustomed to pretty things, including the weather. The storm meant more than just rain. He knew because what he saw threatened the harmony of the land and his vulpi. It was the nature of being in a cursed place. Everything, um, although Volpi was right for his spirit gods and goddesses demanded, it still was in time. Nothing could disrupt the delicate nature of what his work entailed, and an unnatural force of nature would do that. Shifting on his feet, he leaned against the brick wall of the building he hid, hid beside. His dark cloak covered his head and ears, leaving only his face exposed to the elements. The low light where he stood was courtesy of the two moons filling the endless dark expanse above. Countless pinpricks of diamond-like stars peeked through the group of gray clouds. The large silver moon was still in the sky while its twin, the blue moon, had risen, matching its intensity. It was the holy hour on the holiest of days, Muda. It was the time where most were at home and tending to their altars, praying to whatever spirit gods and goddesses who would listen to their greedy prayers in the forsaken land of his birth. He had nothing to worry about. His matron spirit goddess had already deemed him worthy. The soft sound of footsteps approached him from the distance. There was no need to hurry and turn towards the sound because he already knew who it was, even if they were late. He lifted his nose to the air and took a whiff. Their stench of low blood was mixed with cheap ale, a horrid and terrible scented concoction that made him wish he had chosen another. A low growl of disapproval escaped from his chest. He stood in the deep shadows, watching with his glowing golden eyes as the shadowy figures came closer to where he was. One stopped, but another continued on. Golden stepped out of the shadows to meet the one he was waiting for. Did anyone follow you? He asked, as the other drew nearer to him. No, I traveled alone, be uh, the other said before looking back over his shoulders, except for him. Golden eyes simply nodded. Do you have it? I do, he said, and pulled out a wooden box from within the leather pack he wore across his shoulders. Acquiring them was difficult, but I retrieved them. The previous owners won't even realize they're missing, not for a long while, especially with today being Muda. Golden took the nondescript box that was being held from the outstretched hand that opened the lid. There, resting on soft plush fabric, were two large raw gemstones. The stones were black as the darkest night. A living red flame glowed from within, making the stones look like a pair of eyes. Excitement filled him within. He searched long and hard for the gemstones. And once he discovered they were nearby, he set out to do whatever he needed to get them. He didn't care how many Cylons he needed to spend. Money was no object. He reached out with his free hand to touch them, then stopped and decided against it. He could feel the heated stare of the one who brought the stones. Curious red eyes observed him too closely. Uh -huh. Tempering down his enthusiasm, he snapped the lid closed and secured the box into the folds of his cloak, still in disbelief that he now had possession of the rare gemstones. My payment, the courier said, nervously breaking Golden from his thoughts. Ah, yes. He reached into the folds of his clothes and pulled out a leather pouch. He handed it to the wide-eyed Vulpian. All of your Cylons are in there, including a little bonus for securing these quickly. Red's grin stretched from ear to ear as he opened the pouch to count his coins. With the deft speed of his fingers, he untied the leather throng and opened it. Red reached inside and pulled out a handful of coins and let them sift through his fingers. The motion reminded Golden of moving water. Is our business concluded? He asked, more than ready to depart. A sneer formed on his face as he watched the greedy Vulpian take a salon out and bite it. The red courier's head bobbed up and down. A tiny giggle escaped from his lips. More excited than Golden-like, he gave a reply. Yeah, it's concluded. As he watched with disgust, he never enjoyed working with the commoners, but sometimes one had to do what needed to be done, especially when... Um, he needed the utmost discretion. The courier looked back over his shoulders at the one who came with them and held the leather purse up. For some unexplained reason, the exchange made Golden uneasy. He felt the deep mistrust of the creature and then a quiet grasp slipped past his furrowed lips. Red turned back towards Golden and when he noticed his expression, the smile on his face slowly disappeared. He looked down into the pouch once more before tying the leather throng. I, I'll be on my way then. If you need my help again, you know how to find me. Golden doubted he would and said nothing. 
don't trust them. The whisper of words rang clear in his, in his mind, kill them. If he was to get rid of them, then there would be no witnesses to know what had to be what had been done. He knew to never leave a job unfinished. Golden stood there and watched his red eyes darted back to his companion. Under the safety of his cloak, his ears perked up as he listened to their whispering chatter and banter between the two. He didn't like where their conversation was going. Something had to be done. Kill them before it's too late, the whispers said again. Standing there, still as the wind, Golden reached within himself, seeking his powers. The low rumble of thunder above became a deafening, booming sound. Touching his weld, he used the spell stone he wore in his ring and pulled it, pulled from it to amplify his strength. He drew on his magic and raw energy as they intertwined with each other. Golden whispered into the inky darkness that lurked in the crevices of everything, coaxing it to do his bidding. The two others were so engrossed in their own conversation that they failed to notice what was happening around them. Too excited for the large purse of coins they had just gained to notice the night become darker as if it was feeding on itself. They were too caught up to see the tendrils of blackness as it curled around their ankles, then crept up their legs and eventually wrapped around their waist. Golden sauntered towards the carrier of his precious gemstones and stopped when Red and his friends ceased talking. They turned around and looked up, realizing much too late what was happening. Hey, what are you doing, Red asked. His gaze shifted to his friend who shared the same troubled expression. I, I, I promised I won't say anything about the stones or where they came from. I, I, I never go back on my word. My honor is of utmost importance to me. Let's get out of here, Red's friend said with a quiver and trembling in his voice. Golden watched with his amusement as his friend tried to leave but couldn't. When the friend's hand lit up with the green color of his magic, Golden laughed out loud and the sinister, sinister sound made both Vopians caught in his clutches flinch. Honor is a thing of old when you're involved with me. I don't trust you would keep silent. After all, you brought someone with you when I said for you to come alone. Golden lifted his palms up one by one, his fingers slowly in, closed into a fist. The Vulpian standing behind Red Eyes suddenly let out a painful scream that sliced through the silent night. Red Eyes turned to his friend and let out a choked gasp as the creature violently convulsed while standing there. His eyes were back into his head before he collapsed to the ground in a lifeless heap. Fari, get up, Red said nervously. Fari, quit playing around. Get up. I don't think your friend Fari is going to get up or go anywhere, Golden said, with false concern etched in his voice. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, DL. Oh, how atmospheric was that? Rich and strange and creepy. Our third reader, our third reader is J.L. George. J.L. George lives in Cardiff, Wales, where it's very late at night, and writes weird and speculative fiction. Go through it, J.L. So I'm reading from the words, which you can see the cover of uh, there, and you can enter a giveaway for later. Um, and in this book, there are four young people who have a power called the word, which they can use to make other people obey them. They've been raised and experimented on in a facility they know as the centre. And uh, what's happening in this chapter is that Rydian and Jono have managed to run away. And Rydian is looking back on their time at the centre um, while they're in hiding. Rachel was slow to admit it when I asked if her parents had been afraid of her. I think they would have sent me here however they felt, she said at last, her words weighed and careful as they always were. They knew it was their duty to the country. We've been given this power for a purpose, after all. She was quiet for a long moment. But yes, sometimes I think they were a little afraid. Jono snorted and kicked at the table leg when I asked him. Yeah, not likely. They'd have to give a crap I existed to be scared. Anyway, here, he looked down. I only ever used it to make them go to bed instead of opening another bottle. Now I'm here, Dad's probably going to drive himself into a ditch somewhere and he'll only have himself to blame. Caddy, new to the centre and still so timid she almost fell off her chair with fright when I spoke to her, lowered her eyes and shook her head. Not my parents. I don't think they were scared. But Neris... My little sister was scared of me. She sniffled and I froze, paralysed on the spot by the sight of a crying girl. Nobody had ever told me what to do with one. 
Jono came over and put his arm around her shoulders. Don't cry, kiddo, he told her. She didn't object to the kiddo, even though he was only two years older than her. She'll get over it, you'll see. She'll figure out he didn't mean to scare her. You know what you should do, though? You should write to her. Right now, tell her you're sorry and you won't ever use it to hurt her. It'll help if she has that to look at any time she starts to freak out. The sniffle ceased and Caddy scurried off in search of paper. I turned to look at Jono's profile. He was still watching Caddy, biting his lip in thought, his big brown eyes distant. Are you going to write to your parents? I asked him. There was a moment before his expression turned to scorn. What would I do that for? He asked. They don't write to me. Got all the family I need to hear anyway. He nudged me with his shoulder and something warm curled in my stomach. Who needs parents, eh? Yeah, I agreed. Who needs them? And thought guiltily of my mother's last letter sitting unanswered in my nightstand drawer. Let's make a pact, Jono said. We're family. We stick up for each other. And whatever happens, we never, ever use the word on each other. I nodded, feeling that he understood something I'd never spoken. Anybody who didn't have the word couldn't really get it, I thought, how it felt like something alien exploding from the core of you when you used it. Reaching down into the part of yourself from which it emanated was like touching an electric fence, except that the shock was inside of you and then in the air and in your words when you spoke and only when the word was obeyed were you free of it. It made you tremble with relief in another person's fear. It made a monster of you, if only for a moment. Yeah, I said. All right. Family. Jono's face turned thoughtful. We should be blood brothers, he said. Do you know what that is? I shook my head. It's when you cut your palms and then you press them together like this. He clasped my hand in his, making me blink in surprise. So that your blood mixes together. And that makes you family, just like if you were born related. He frowned and looked round. Maybe I can get May to lend us some scissors. Tell her we need to do a craft project or something. At that moment, someone cleared her throat and we found May standing beside us, behind us, hands on her hips. We were late for our maths class and Mrs. Jameson would be looking for us. Jono let loose his usual litany, litany of grumbles about why did we need to learn maths anyway? Because it wasn't as if we had to do our own shopping or pay our own rent. But we trooped off to class where Jono grinned and giant mimed jabbing at the palm of his hand with his compass. By that time, I'd lost my nerve and I grimaced and shook my head and Jono teased me the rest of the afternoon for being chicken. Two days later, maths class was cancelled. Mrs. Jameson didn't show up for two weeks and she came back pale and subdued, her gaze sliding windowwards mid-sentence as Jono and I passed notes at our desks. May told us our teacher's husband had died. Of course, she should have been prepared for that when she let him go into the army. Is it that dangerous being in the army? I wondered aloud. Back home before the centre. The uniform patrols had been a simple fact of life. Something to be grumbled about when they blocked a main road at rush hour, but ignored the rest of the time. It was difficult to imagine those bored-looking men running for their lives from gunfire. May cocked her head thoughtfully, then patted my arm and told me that, of course I knew no different. The war had started before I was born. Through a crack in I see men in khaki striding up and down the street, pounding on doors. They're all men. They're always all men, though I remember May telling me that when she was a girl, women were allowed to join the armed forces. She mentioned it after Mrs. Jameson's husband died, telling us that her sister had wanted to be a pilot and that she'd been selfishly glad when they changed the rules. The soldiers get no response to their knocking. No surprise there. All the residents fled after the bombing that left the two houses at the end of the street in rubble. The one we're hiding in now bears the signs of their hasty departure. An empty box file on the kitchen table. The all-important papers bundled up before they ran. A forgotten scarf draped over the back of a chair. A child's picture book open at a picture of a smiling cartoon tiger. Not that I've ever seen a real tiger, but from the stripes, I assume that's what it is. A knock on the front door of the house we're in. It hits me like a blow to the head. I stand, frozen, until John o finally galvanised into movement, tugs me into the front room. 
We sit on the carpet for fear of our shadows throwing the, through, showing through the curtains and wait for the soldiers' footsteps to retreat back to the far end of the street, past the bombed out houses, to where the machine waits. Thank you, that's it. Oh, very nice. Thank you, JL. That's so, so close to the ordinary life and so strange. Our fourth reader is C. O. Davidson. C. O. Davidson's work has appeared in Suripad, Bastarian, Cemetery Gates, Georgia Gothic, Generation X, and Hard to Find, an anthology of new Southern Gothic. She co-edited Monsters of Film, Fiction, and Fable, and is a member of the Atlanta Horror Writers Association and Bradley Writers. CO, it's yours. I'll be reading a story that is included in this collection, and I also have this book for a giveaway. <laughs> Elliot sits on the curb, shivering, despite the humid night, an unopened bag of Funyuns clutched in his hands. Blue lights wash over him. Two county cops stand by their squad cars. Elliot thinks he recognizes one of them. As they talk, their eyes shift to him, then slide back to their notepads, their radios, each other, and then Elliot again. A silent ambulance pulls into the parking lot. Somewhere in the stop right, in a back room, amid shrink-wrapped pallets of Slim Jims and corn nuts, in the glow of a security monitor, cops huddle, reviewing the tape. In a wash of video blues and static, in the upper left-hand frame, a young girl mixes sodas, 7-Up, Mountain Dew, high sea Orange. A suicide, that's what they called it in my day, when you mix all those flavors together. Hip cocked in white jeans, she slides to the left and tops it with wild cherry Pepsi. She seals her drink and stabs the top with a straw, relief to the boredom of this night. Meanwhile, five miles away in the center of town, the football stadium glows, drawing the rest of her classmates, their parents, their grandparents, cousins, most of the town, all of them wanting to feel connected to something bigger than themselves, like Jesus she thinks to herself, not knowing that she's already a ghost on this tape. Back pressed against his locker, Elliot watches her cut through the crowded hall, gray eyes, pink lips, blonde crimped hair floating over her shoulders. A head taller than many of the boys, she never walks slump shoulders, this is not embarrassed by her height. She's better than that. Later that night, stretched out on his narrow bed in his small paneled bedroom, carpet mildewed, the ceiling fan turning and turning and turning until his vision blurs and Connie appears, turning and turning and turning in the hallway at school, looking over her shoulder, seeing him, seeing her. She smiles. Last spring, after a Saturday swim meet, was the first time he saw her. Per his detention, he had to clean the locker rooms and pick up trash around the stands at the pool. Chlorine burning his nose, he picks up a wadded paper cup some slob parent dropped, and when he looks up, she's there, wearing a red suit, tall and wet and beautiful as a knife. She stands by the pool, toes curling over the edge, staring across the water. The meat had been over for an hour. Elliot freezes, clutching the metal trash can to his chest. Finnick, Coach Wexler yells from his office. Meat's over! She takes two steps back, turns, and walks into the girl's locker room, leaving each damp print behind her that fades in the concrete, each curved like a mysterious note. A week later, he sits on the floor in bound periodicals, the back row of the library. He balances a thick paperback on his knees as he eats lunch, bologna and white bread, no drink. A shadow passes his periphery. He braces himself for the rebuke, another detention. Sorry. Is this aisle taken? From down here, she looks even taller, loose blonde hair, leather, leather jacket, jeans, those so white tennis shoes. She sa he shakes his head. Connie walks down the aisle and sits a few feet from him, 
her back against the same shelf as his. She unshoulders her backpack and sets it between them. I didn't realize anybody was here, she says. Unzips her backpack, pulling out a Coke and a Snickers. Want one? She pulls out a second candy bar and holds it out to Elliot. Price of admission for invading your space? Oh, it's okay. Go on, I take them from work. Perk of the job. Elliot takes the candy bar. Their fingers almost touch. Thanks. How is it? Good, he says after a bite. She laughs. I mean the book. I love King. Oh, he is good. This is even longer than the stand. It's about a bunch of kids, right? Probably an asshole father too. He definitely gets those. Not that my dad is swinging any mallets or anything. My stepdad. Miss Finnick. Mr. Link, the vice principal, blocks the end of the aisle. Backlit by fluorescent light, his dark suit looks cut from tin. Just what do the two of you think you're doing in here? Lunch should be eaten in the cafeteria, not the library. A tutoring session. Miss Sissel says it was okay if we meet in here, sir. Elliot sags against the shelf. Why else would anyone believe Connie Finnick would waste her lunch period with him? Link squints at Elliot, mouth forming a hard line instead of the word he wants to say. Trash. A beat. Bell's in two minutes. Get to class. I don't want to catch the two of you eating in here again. Link pivots like a clockwork and leaves them. Connie stands with her Coke and backpack. Another asshole, right? Yeah. We'll see you in class, she says, and smiles at him. And this will be the best day of his life. Fast forward. Hey, stop. Center frame, she sits behind the cash register. Sleeves of her letter jacket pushed up, holding open one-handed a fat paper bag. From its cover, a demonic clown stares up with silver eyes. Her own eyes still on the page, she takes a long pull of her soda from a bent straw. Suddenly she straightens, rolls her eyes, takes a breath and lets it out slowly. She places the book face down on the counter, looks over toward the door. A man walks into the frame, average height, Face turned away from the camera, a bald spot, glasses, dark numbers only jacket. She smiles and says, oh, wait a minute, what's she saying? Oh, damn, no audio. A glitch in the tape, snow, nothing but snow. Time stop, six minutes later, out of the static, blue October snow, center frame, the counter, an empty space where the girl had been reading. To the left of frame, there, a boy kneeling, back to the camera, baggy jeans, dark hoodie. He stands, turns, stumbling back, a bag of chips in his hands. That's the kid, right? Yep, that's him. Ran his brother in last year. Only a matter of time till that one gets to juvie. The boy looks up at the camera, pupils blown wide, eyes dark, haunted. Guilty? Oh, we can stop the tape here. I said, what were you doing here, boy? The officer stands with the notebook in his hand, pen gripped like a gun. Another cop stands behind him, hands on his belt, stands wide. Elliot can't speak. He stares down at the Funyuns in his hands, but they aren't his hands anymore. Kid? Hey, kid! There must be proof, Elliot thinks. Security cameras. In the back room. In the glow of the monitors. The security tape. Elliot could play it. Hit pause. On Connie smiling, forever shimmering, hit rewind, even back to the very beginning, to before she ever walked into work that night, before she ever walked into this job. Then he'd yank out all that black tape, unspool it, so what happened tonight will never happen, even if it means he too will disappear. But he's already gone. Out on the highway, an 18-wheeler roars by, and Elliot feels pulled in its wake, a paper bag waltzing across the bypass, a piece of trash blown across the asphalt into a cornfield, caught up in the tall green leaves, the stars wheeling above. There, he will be stuck forever waiting for her ghost. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my. Thank you, Crystal. Our fifth reader is Luna McNamara. Lula McNamara is a social worker by day and by night she writes about historical women and forgotten gods. Lula holds a master's degree from Harvard University in the study of women and gender in world religions. She has also studied 
ancient Greek language and philosophy. She lives in Boston with her faithful lock rabbit, Leo. Take it away, Luna. Hello, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I actually have Leo here too, so. Um, and I, to talk a little bit about my novel, Psyche and Eros, I was always very interested in that myth uh, from Greco-Roman mythology. And what really intrigued me about it was the strength and character of Psyche, who, unlike a lot of women in mythology, really saves herself and her beloved. And so I was interested in telling a love story in which the two characters change because of each other, but not for each other. So I'll be reading from the prologue of Psyche and Eros. Um, the third type of love is Eros, which explains itself. Connection, spark, the desire of the body to seek fulfillment in another. Most people experience at least one of these loves in a lifetime, but it is rare to have all three at once, intertwined like a golden braid. This is what the playwright Aristophanes spoke of when he wove his tale many years after the events of this one, seeking to illuminate the origin of love in its trifold complexity. He claimed that the first human beings were born back to back, with two faces and four hands and four legs, each mouth chattering incessantly to its companion as they rolled like wheels over the earth. Zeus grew wary of the power of these people and split them apart with his thunderbolts. They turned into humans as we know them today, who walk around on two legs and speak with only one mouth. And so it is that love came to exist, the playwright claimed, each of us seeking our other half. I laughed when I heard this. I had been present at the beginning of the world, and it wasn't anything like that. It is a pretty story, though nothing could be further from the truth for Psyche and I. There's no pretending that we were two parts of some cosmic whole. She was a mortal woman and I a god when we first met, each fierce in our independence. We were not severed halves, we were complete unto ourselves. It is possible that our paths would never have crossed at all had it not been for a chance mistake. There is something powerful in this, I think. We were not enthralled to destiny or fate, but merely the weight of our own choices. When we turn toward each other, like flowers facing the sun, we were not fulfilling some prophecy or old story. We were writing our own. So thank you for listening to my read. And also I will be doing a giveaway uh, for two hardcover copies of the books to be sent out to anyone in the continental United States who signs up. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Luna. That was marvelous. Our final reader is Jesse Mahalik. Jesse Mahalik has a degree in computer science, and I love their things geeky. A software engineer by trade, Jessie now writes third time from her home in Texas. She's the author of three space opera trilogies featuring smart, dangerous women and smitten men. Go for it, Jessie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am Jesse Mahalik. I do write space opera romance. And today I'm reading from Capture the Sun, which is the third book in my Starlight Shadow trilogy. And if you like what you hear, you can read the first chapters of all of my books on my website at jessemahalik.com. This scene happens early in the book, just after Lexi Bowen, an intergalactic thief for hire, arrives on Velovia to meet a potential employer. But instead, she runs into some trouble in the hotel and is looking for an escape route. A tall, lean man wearing a long hooded coat appeared in my path, and I jerked to a halt. He hadn't stepped out of a doorway or from a hidden alcove. He'd literally appeared from thin air, something no human could accomplish. A teleporter wasn't as deadly as a telekinetic, but they were much harder to evade. I slid the hem of my dress up, drew the plaz knife strapped to my thigh, and activated it. The 10 center centimeter energy blade shimmered into existence glowing red, the lethal setting. The short blade wasn't a huge threat, but it was better than nothing. 
Behind me, a deep voice shouted, stop, as if I was going to listen to that. The man in front of me tilted his head and I caught a glimpse of a familiar one-sided smile. My breath caught. It couldn't be. He closed the distance between us. The hood shadowed his face, but I would know those striking Gold Street green eyes anywhere. Nilo Shorin, Voloff, hand-to-hand specialist, teleporter, liar, had just found me, even though I'd been on planet for less than two hours. A maelstrom of emotion arose. Annoyance, anger, desire, happiness, and most dangerous of all, hope. I kept the blade between us. His smile grew wider and he murmured, going to stab me? Depends. Are you going to betray me again? Something fleeting crossed his face, but he shook his head. Believe it or not, I'm here to help. I didn't believe it, but another shout behind me proved that I didn't have much choice. Nilo stepped closer and I deactivated the blade. When I stabbed him, it would be because I'd meant it, not by accident. Take a deep breath, he ordered as his hands clamped around my bare upper arms. I sucked in a breath to tell him exactly where he could shove his orders, but I didn't get a chance before cold power washed over me and the world disappeared. The vertigo was instant and intense. It felt like spinning through zero gravity where there was no up or down, just endless twists and turns in inky darkness. Tavi had tried to explain it, but she left out a few pertinent details. Like how I could still feel Nilo's taut body pressed up against mine, a tiny reassurance in this hellacious void and how I could feel his power, sharp and cold, swirling around both of us, binding us together. The glass of wine I drank was dangerously close to reappearing when the world popped back into existence. Nilo stumbled and we both nearly went down. He cursed and steadied me for a second, then let go. My stomach heaved, unhappy with the entire ordeal. What were you thinking, coming to Volovia? Nilo started, his tone furious, but I tuned him out. I closed my eyes, tilted my head back, and took several deep, calming breaths. It helped. I still felt nauseous, but I no longer felt like I would immediately vomit on Nilo's shoes. When I opened my eyes, he held out a reusable bottle. I dropped the plaz knife in my tote and accepted it. Nilo still wore a scowl, but it was tempered by reluctant sympathy. Sorry, he grumbled. Humans tend to have stronger reaction than Voloffs. I should have warned you. I opened the bottle and took a cautious sip of cold water. When it stayed down, I took a longer drink and looked around. The fading sunlight revealed that we were in a narrow clearing surrounded by a forest of massive coniferous trees. A small house blended into the landscape with dark brown wooden siding, a curved front wall of floor-to-ceiling windows, and a sloping green roof covered in plants. There were no other houses nearby. Indeed, with the exception of what was likely a shed or a garage, there were no other structures nearby, just trees, trees, and more trees. Nervousness drifted through me like smoke. Despite our squabbles, I didn't think Nilo would take me into the woods and murder me, But if he tried, no one would hear me scream. Of course, if he was stupid enough to try, then no one would hear him scream either. Bolstered by that thought, I turned and gave him the same slow perusal I'd just given our surroundings. At some point while I'd been trying to keep my wine down, he'd pushed back his hood, giving me a clear view, and one thing remained true. Nilo Shorin was an unfairly handsome man. Not only did he have a bone structure that would make models weep with envy, but he also had dark hair, tan skin, and stunning eyes. Nilo's irises were startlingly green, as deep and vibrant as the forest around us, and streaked through with bolts of gold. Balaf's eyes always tended to be interesting, but Nilo's were over the top. I pulled myself away from the magnetic draw of his gaze and looked at the rest of him. He was looking more unkempt than usual. His hair was too long, and several days' worth of dark stubble shadowed his jaw. There was a subtle weariness to expression that even his usual charming facade couldn't quite hide. Are you okay? I asked with a frown. That surprised a chuckle out of him. It's been a long week, he admitted. His humor evaporated and he leveled a glare at me. And a lot of that is thanks to you. What were you thinking returning here? I lifted an eyebrow at his tone. I don't have to defend my decisions to you. Even if those decisions often started and ended with money. Why did you grab me? Where are we? He sighed and swept an arm towards the house. Welcome to my home. I glanced between him and the building. It wasn't what I'd pictured for him in the brief moments I'd allowed myself to think of it at all, but I suppose a teleporter could live anywhere. Envy nipped at me. How much easier would my job be if I could just flit around with a thought? I realize it might not be what you're used to, Nilo started, a note of defensiveness in his voice. I shook myself from my thoughts and interrupted him before he could take offense. It's beautiful, just not what I expected. His expression lit with interest. What did you expect? 
I figured you'd be closer to the city, probably in one of the tall buildings in the central district. I could almost picture it, a fancy condo with no hint of personality and furniture that was made for looks rather than comfort. I'd had a very similar place until I'd realized it was a waste of money when I spent the vast majority of my time away on jobs. Nilo's mouth twisted into a sardonic smile. I own a flat on the 42nd floor of the third tallest building, he admitted, but this is a better option for now. Why? Because Empress Nepru doesn't know it exists. My blood froze in my veins. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jesse. That was great. And thank you so much to everyone who came today.